Hello, Prananda. Good afternoon, Wales Africa community. Um, my name is Kat Jones, and I'm very pleased to be hosting the session for you this afternoon, together with Catherine Thomas and Alison Fiander. Um, so this is part of the Wales Africa Health Links Network Conference 2020, um, Health for All. The event that we're going to be talking about this afternoon is women's health. What you're on at the moment is a webinar for format, which means that only the panelists can share their microphones and the videos. So all the other attendees are muted. If you would like to make a contribution to the discussion or to comment on anything, please use the chat function at the right hand side of your window. If you have any questions to send in, you can also use the question and answer box, which you can access by pressing the ask a question button, which should be appearing at the bottom of your screen. Um, the presentation that Alison is going to put on for us will be about 25 minutes and then Catherine is going to be dealing with questions at the end. Um, so please make sure that you can flag these um, when you're ready. As Hub Cymru Africa, we really value your feedback on the event. So please do complete the feedback survey that we're going to be posting into the chat box at the end of the session. Um, just a reminder to everybody, I know we're, we're all here for the right reasons, but any form of abusive or offensive language or inappropriate messages into the chat boxes will be deleted and I'll be um, monitoring that as we go through the event. Um, so I'm now going to hand over the event to Catherine Thomas, who is the chair of the World's Africa Health Links Network. Um, please enjoy. Thank you very much, Kat, and welcome everybody to this really interesting session. I'm delighted to be able to introduce um, Professor Alison Fiander, who um, is a consultant gynaecologist with a special interest in women's cancer. Um, in 2002, she was appointed the Chair of Obstetrics and Gynaecology and the Head of Department in the University of Wales College of Medicine. Um, and uh, she, subsequent to that, she also became clinical lead to the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology Centre for Women's Global Health. Um, she's now retired, but she can look back on a long career and, uh, in which she spent several years off and on working in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. She's worked in Ghana, Tanzania, Sierra Leone and South Africa. Um, so her experience in this area, particularly around um, women's voice and, um, it, uh, and the stigma uh, uh, of um, women's health issues and how women have uh, struggled to get access to good quality health care, which shows itself in the poor outcomes in some countries of um, women's health and maternal health. So I'm delighted that Alison is speaking to us. I'm also delighted that earlier this year she agreed to become a trustee for the Wales and Africa Health Links Network. So i um, really pleased to have her on board and I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got to say, Alison. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Catherine, and good afternoon, everybody. Well, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you today um, at the Wales and Africa Health Link Network Conference on a subject that's really close to my heart. Um, as Catherine said, I'm a past chair of obstetrics and gynaecology at Cardiff University, but I've also spent a number of years during my career working in the field of women's health in Africa, and that's both West and East Africa, and then laterally um, South Africa as well. So I want to talk to you about sexual reproductive health and equality. And it's a topic that I'm passionate about because women's health is so important, not only to an individual woman's quality of life, but also to the well-being of her family, her community and society as a whole. And I'll come to that a bit more later on. Next slide, please. So I had wanted to set the scene by showing you a really powerful video called The Girl Effect, but I'm reliably told that it doesn't um, project very well in Crowdcast. So I've we posted the link in the chat box and I'd like you to have a look at it at home. It's only about three minutes long, but it just illustrates the importance for uh, for sexual reproductive health for a girl and how this impacts on her rights, her equality and her place in the world. And it just kind of sets the scene. So if you have a chance, please um, have a watch of this video at home. Next slide, please. 
So why am I passionate about sexual reproductive health? I think it's partly because it offends me that the world is so unfair to so many women. So, for example, despite the achievements in reducing maternal mortality in trying to reach the MDGs and now the SDG, it's true that over 800 women still lose their lives every day as a result of pregnancy and childbirth. And 25% of these are adolescents, so they're teenagers, and 99% of deaths occur in developing countries. So in many resource poor settings, this proverb is true. To be pregnant is to have one foot in the grave. Next slide, please. So this is the maternal mortality map and it shows you the risk of dying in childbirth. The red areas are areas of very high risk. The pink areas are high risk and the yellow areas are moderate risk of dying in pregnancy and childbirth. And you can see just at a glance, the worst hit areas are sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide, please. So here it shows you that the top 10 places that you are most likely to die in childbirth are all in Africa. In fact, half of all maternal deaths globally occur in sub-Saharan Africa. In Chad, the lifetime risk of maternal death is one in 15. And in Sierra Leone, it's a one in eight lifetime risk of dying in pregnancy and childbirth. Next slide, please. And here's what kills women. So the top five direct killers are hemorrhage, sepsis, hypertensive disease, obstructed labor and abortion. And I want you to note here the relatively high contribution to maternal mortality that abortion makes. So 15% of all maternal deaths globally are due to abortion, and that's mainly unsafe abortion. In some countries, it's significantly higher than 15%, nearing 30%. And that's particularly where abortion is outlawed or illegal. Next slide, please. So in fact, five to six deaths every hour, day in and day out, are due to abortion, usually unsafe abortion. And abortion is extremely common. So of 213 million pregnancies each year globally, 40% are unplanned. So that means 85 million unplanned pregnancies in the world each year and we know that 50% of these end in abortion and 50% of these are unsafe abortions and the end result of all that is 47,000 deaths of women and girls each year. Next slide please. So this is a maternal mortality map for unsafe abortion. So the darker the orange, the worse the problem. And you can see straight away that it mirrors the global maternal mortality map. The hardest hit areas are sub-Saharan Africa and maybe parts of Asia. Um, and worst of all is East Africa. Next slide, please. So mortality is only the tip of the iceberg. Um, beneath the surface, we've got a huge problem of maternal morbidity. Next slide, please. So there's no global definition for maternal morbidity, um, but it's true that millions of women and girls suffer injury and disability, estimated at between 10 and 20 million uh, women every year. And it's also been estimated that for every death, 30 women suffer either severe injury or disability. 
And one such example is obstetric fistula. Next slide, please. So I don't know whether you all know what an obstetric fistula is, but it's an abnormal passage between either the bladder and the vagina or between the rectum and the vagina. And the, the consequences are absolutely devastating on a woman's quality of life. She will be incontinent of urine and possibly feces as well, unless she finds a skilled surgeon and nursing team that can repair that fistula for her. Next slide, please. There was a report by the UK All Party Parliamentary Group into Obstetric Fistula, and they were so appalled actually by the physical and psychological consequences of obstetric fistula that they called their report better off dead. Next slide, please. So the numbers for maternal mortality and morbidity are probably underestimates. Um, many women fail to reach a healthcare facility and their deaths go unrecorded. And it's true that many of these deaths could have been prevented by family planning or contraception. Actually, the unmet need for family planning in the world affects 225 million women. And the greatest need is where maternal mortality is highest. So in sub-Saharan Africa, amongst adolescents, amongst those living in poverty, um, amongst refugees, and um, strangely enough, women who are in the postpartum period because they've just had a baby, they need time um, to recover from that pregnancy before they become pregnant again. And family planning makes economic sense because for every pound spent on family planning, 11 pounds are saved by not having to treat the complications of pregnancy. Next slide, please. How important is contraception then? Um, can we just go back one slide, please? How important is contraception as a public health initiative? Well, put um, simply, it's of vital importance because if we could satisfy the global unmet need for family planning, we could reduce, we could reduce maternal mortality by 30% overnight because unplanned um, pregnancy kills women and we can prevent them dying from complications of um, pregnancy or from unsafe abortion by preventing unplanned pregnancies. So it's an extremely effective public health intervention. Next slide, please. And this is another map showing unmet family planning needs. The data is incomplete, but the red areas show the greatest need. And you can once again see that this reflects the um, maternal mortality maps and the maps for deaths from unsafe abortion. So it's all tied up. Next slide, please. So if we're going to address sexual reproductive health, it means that we start to, uh, we need to start addressing the elephants in the room. So those topics that we don't quite like talking about. So we need to start talking about unplanned, unwanted pregnancy, contraception and abortion. And I'm very well aware that it may be difficult for some of us that hold religious or cultural beliefs. But given that women and girls are dying, it's imperative that we do something about this very important area of public health. And Maybe if there's time afterwards, we could discuss or um, think about how much uh, the stigma around these topics still holds sway um, and prevents us from acknowledging and addressing the issues. Next slide, please.
So if sexual reproductive health is so important, why aren't we doing more about it? If we were to undertake a root cause analysis, is it because it's a woman's problem? Is it related to the state of the women where women are seen as second class citizens who lack education, who have poor access to sexual and reproductive health services, women that live in poverty without an independent um, income? Is it true that even in 2020, women globally die and suffer poor quality of life because they still lack a voice and don't count? Next slide, please. Some um, see the root cause of poor women's health as being due to the five Ps. The first we've already mentioned is poverty, made worse by fees for health services, fees for treatment and travel costs. And then there's patriarchy. The United Nations regards gender equality as a human right and it points out that empowering women is an indispensable tool for advancing development and reducing poverty. There's often prejudice towards issues to do with sexual reproductive health and I've already mentioned some of the stigma around these subjects. Politics affects sexual reproductive health and a good example of this is the global gag call in the United States. The gag rule denies foreign organisations that receive any US funding for family planning the right to use their own non-US funds to provide information, referrals or services for legal abortion. And finally, policies. These are often influenced by the other P's of patriarchy, prejudice and politics. Um, and perhaps examples include the imprisonment of women suffering miscarriage because of mistakenly thinking that they have tried to procure an abortion, or laws in Uganda that allow healthcare providers to disclose HIV test results without an individual's consent. Next slide, please. So if you're interested to take this further, I can really recommend this book. It's called Half the Sky by Nicholas Christoph and Cheryl Wooden. And they assert that the need to address the status of women is fundamental to global development and stability. It's subtitled How to Change the World. So if any of you are interested in, in saving the world, you need to read this book. And actually what's really encouraging is that this book shows things that we can do right now. Next slide, please. The authors of this book say that the key points to address include the education of women and girls, addressing women's health, especially sexual reproductive health, empowering women as decision makers, and ensuring economic empowerment and addressing gender-based violence. Next slide, please. So this means standing up for women's health, not missing opportunities, addressing the elephants in the room, and ensuring that sexual reproductive health services are afforded high priority and that the healthcare providers providing these services are valued and supported. And this is often not the case. So um, healthcare providers working in the area of um, reproductive sexual health or in women's health are often stigmatized and there's prejudice against them and they're not supported very well. Women's health is also important for environmental sustainability and mitigating climate change. And it might surprise you that I say that, 
But what I want to do now is introduce you to a project called Project Drawdown to show you why. So if we could have the next slide, please. So Project Drawdown is um, led by Paul Hawken, and it's about drawing down carbon emissions and reversing global warning, warming. And the website is shown on this slide. The project models the top 100 solutions to reverse climate change across seven different sectors or areas. Those areas are food, energy, land use, women and girls, materials, buildings and cities, and transport. And out of the top 100 solutions to reverse climate change, the sixth and seventh most effective solutions are educating women and girls and family planning. And it's so difficult to separate out the effects of these two that they're grouped together, and together they could mitigate 10% total emissions impact and could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 105 gigatons. We can have the next slide. So this is um, a pie chart showing the relative reduction in carbon emissions by solution. And it's color coded by sector or area. So the red um, bars, for instance, are the food based solutions. The yellow bars are the energy solutions. And the pink solutions um, relate to women and girls. So you can see here that family planning and educating women makes a very significant contribution to reversing global warming. Um, and taken together, they can reduce carbon emissions by 10%. And I think the other thing that's important to bear in mind about Project um, Drawdown is that these solutions are not things that are waiting to happen or waiting to be discovered sometime in the future. They're all solutions that are doable now. Next slide, please. So as we start to draw to a close, um, the right to health, it's been said, is a human right. And the health of a nation is determined by the health of its women and girls. Next slide, please. Professor Fatella um, said this, um, Professor Fatella was a past pre president of FIGOS, that's the International Federation of Obstetrics and Gynaecology, and he said women are not dying of diseases we cannot treat, they are dying because societies have yet to decide that their lives are worth saving. Next slide please. I think that all of this feels a bit heavy, it feels a bit sombre, but I think there is hope. Next slide, please. And I think the SDGs give us hope. Um, SDG three and five are particularly applicable to women's health. So SDG three aims to reduce the global maternal mortality ratio to under 70, per 100,000 live births by 2030. And SDG 5 aims to promote gender equality and ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive healthcare services, including family planning, information and education, and integration of reproductive health into national strategies and programs. So there is um, hope offered by the SDGs. Next slide, please. Right, this, this is my final map to show you. It's a map of countries with a critical shortage of healthcare providers, shown by the dark orange. And again, it reflects the maternal mortality maps and the unmet need for contraception. The Proportional shortfalls are greatest in sub-Saharan Africa, 
but numerical de deficits are also very large in Southeast Asia because of its population size. We can muse on some of the driving forces behind the workforce gap, um, such as the large burden of disease in low resource settings, maybe poor health financing, maybe challenges for medical education, um, and increasing globalization that results in um, brain drain, concentration of providers in urban areas, poor working conditions, lack of continued professional education opportunities and maybe poor supervision. And this all leads to a reduction in the quality and safety of care provision. Next slide, please. So I think um, this presents an opportunity for health links to make a real difference. And um, my plea is that you don't forget sexual reproductive health in your links. The services required aren't high tech but they're extremely cost effective and have huge implications for the well-being of women, families, communities and society in general. And um, given the pandemic and um, our health minister said this earlier, we need to do things differently and we need to seize the opportunity to develop even further online education and training. I think we're going to need innovative ways to uh, teach practical skills online, um, to make workshops interactive, to address attitudes and so on. And I think the question is how far are we willing to explore and develop new methods of delivery? Now I'm aware that not everyone has reliable access to the internet um, in Africa but the major centres often do have good access and it may be appropriate to undertake training of trainers online and then cascade out to other healthcare providers. And obviously online delivery reduces not only the risk of COVID-19, but the environmental costs of international travel. Next slide, please. So I'll just leave you with this thought. It's very easy to say that something needs to be done. It's not so easy to find solutions which really work and make a difference. So the challenge, I think, is for each of us to play our part. So next slide, please. And I just want to thank you for listening um, to a topic that's very close to my heart. Thank you. Wow, Alison, <laughs> that's a very, very powerful, um, very powerful presentation. There's quite a few comments there about how that should be widely shared. Um, and I have to say, even though I know some of those statistics, when you put it so clearly and eloquently, it's absolutely shocking, really shocking. So it, um, we, we all have stories, we've all seen this in real life, and I'm just thinking the last few months, our partners in Lesotho, um, we heard that after a school strike at the end of uh, last year, before Christmas, um, about 60 um, schoolgirls became pregnant. So, um, and that's because they're vulnerable, they're at, the schools are shut and, and, and um, they're living in hostels and there's no one to protect them. So getting pregnant as a teenager, as you so eloquently put, is, is extremely dangerous. And then you lose out on all the other opportunities and it's a knock on effect then on the next generation, the next generation. So really powerful um, presentation there. And it, it made me think, um, if, I, if anybody wants to ask questions, please do um, put them. There's an ask a question box there, um, and you can also put it in the chat. So I'm going to kick off with, with one question, which is, it kind of made me think about um, the Black Lives Matter movement and how um, we have all been uh, aware of the... Um, racist inequalities globally but it's become much clearer to us about allyship and do you think there's something there about how 
we're all aware of how um, inequalities affect women, gender in inequities affect women. But as you put at the end, you know, we realize I am the somebody. So what's the role for men who are often in very powerful positions in, in all those five P's you pointed out, in politics and policy and even frontline delivery? What, what do you think men can do about this? in a similar way that we talked about allyship mm. in Black Lives Matter? I think it's um, men recognising that um, they can play such a valuable part because they are in, um, they're in powerful positions. They often hold um, powerful political positions. And it's actually saying, actually, these things matter. So um, sexual reproductive health affects um, well, affects both genders, but uh, you know, if we get the basics right, if if they will stand up and say, well, let's have fair um, policies for access to the family planning, um, access to uh, information and education or on sexual health, um, they can make a huge difference because they are the people in power. They are the people that that um, people are listening to. Um, but I think. Um, then we need to make that information, uh, the people in power need to make that information accessible to the general population and to the communities they serve. Mm. I think it's, it, you're right in that it's making the case that every gender is affected by this. If, if women are dying, it's their boy children who uh, will suffer just as much as such a major impact on families and communities all around, isn't it? Mm. So um, I've got a few questions here. One, just a quick one now about the pie chart that you showed about um, the um, effects of um, family planning and women's education on climate change. Is where has that come from? So is that is from the website. Um, I put up the website. I'm just looking. See if I can see the reference. Um, that comes from the website, the Project Drawdown website. So if you were to look at um, Google Project Drawdown, that, um, that pie chart is on there. And it, it's also got a lot more of the actual data, how they collected the data, um, how different um, solutions can, can affect um, global emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. That's a powerful advocacy tool, isn't it? Mm. Um, there's another question. Um, could you give some examples of relatively low-tech and inexpensive strategies that we could use? Well, I mean, actually, family planning is low-tech. You know, it's not expensive. Um, but just thinking about family planning, that there are better use, better ways of, better methods to use. So, for instance, LARC, which are long-acting reversible contraceptives, such as um, the interuterine device or the implant, that's, they last for between three and five years. And that means that women don't have to keep going back to the clinic to get um, injections or to get more supplies of pills. And they, and, and the risk is that sometimes these supplies run out or somebody forgets to go and get their next injection. So these long acting methods are very effective at spacing births out um, and at prote protecting um, girls from getting pregnant too early. So there, there are things just to do with contraception is one, um, one area. Um, another area is that up to 25% of, of women and girls suffer heavy menstrual bleeding, so heavy periods. And that affects their ability to, to work. Um, it, it affects their, their social, you know, be, be able to do things socially. It affects girls being able to go to, to um, school. And a lot of girls miss one week a month just because they have um, heavy periods and they're not able to go to school. But you can control heavy periods either with the oral contraceptive pill or with an, a medicated intrauterine device. And they're not very expensive. So they're, 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 they're 
safe, easy, low tech solutions to use. So there are ways of addressing some of the major women women's health issues quite um, quite cheaply and effectively. Thank you. Is it, there's a linked question here that when you're talking about um, girls and access to education um, and how menstruation impacts on on, on that, um, and the question is. How early should we be raising this in the educational curriculum in schools? And that's both in sub-Saharan Africa and in Wales. Um, and uh, are there issues about how you address both sexes in mm. doing that? That's a really good, I think that's a really good question um, because um, I think we should start really early. I think we should start from the beginning of secondary school, actually, because we know that at 14 years old, 20% of um, teenagers are sexually active in the UK. So leaving it till sort of sixth form is, is too late. So I think we need to sort of normalize um, sexual health education very early on. For, so from the beginning of secondary school and, and add to it really, because there's a lot I think we could do with um, not just um, you know the the sexual health thing but more about um healthy relationships and preparing um children for healthy relationships in the future and i think it's the same thing goes in um in africa we need to start really really early talking about these things because i think actually if you talk to girls about um the benefits of delaying first pregnancy you start to empower them to make choices about their fertility, about whether um, they want to use um, family planning. Um, so I think start really early and kind of normalize it. And actually that, that applies to both genders. I think we, we need to talk to boys and girls about that. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think it's, uh, again, it's uh, addressing boys as well, because I've heard of work in Kenya where, um, about domestic violence and that addressing uh, young boys in school that had a, a, a big impact because then they they then didn't tolerate it and called it out in their families and when they got older. So um, I've got another question here, um, which is um, looking at the links between the health system. Uh, so what's the role of healthcare services? Um, in addressing the reduction in maternal mortality, particularly in countries like Somalia, where you have um, health facilities that lack even the basic equipment and training. So what's the role if health, health services are really struggling with the basics? How can they uh, reduce maternal mortality? That's another good question. I think um, it comes down to training and and thinking about the organization of health services so um, it's and it's having a system of of um, for instance being able to have basic emergency obstetric care units where you can deal with basic emergencies but having a system of um, then um, referring on to a higher level of care if necessary and thinking about the transport needs there as well um, so it needs sort of um, it needs thinking about the actual system and the referral system, but I think you can do quite a lot. Um, most women will deliver without fancy high tech facilities, but they need to be clean. They need to be safe. Um, so I think we can do a lot in training and and um, thinking about um, decision making um, during pregnancy and also in labour. So that's really important. And there, there, are, there is quite a lot of training that can be done there. Um, and it's, it's just examining what facilities are available at each referral level and thinking what's appropriate, what can we manage? And I think also, I mean, one of the biggest um, ways that we can um, help maternal mortality is to use a partogram, which we use in this country, we use all over Africa, but it's, paying attention to the partogram and referring early if things are not going right. Thank you. Um, people are 
looking for um, for good simple ideas here. I think there's one question that says, uh, "I'm interested in what the most effective simple project you have seen in action for addressing this issue in resource poor settings." So, can you think of a, a good example where so, that, that has actually made a difference? Something um, effective and simple. I think um, one of the things um, that's quite impressed me is um, doing some emergency obstetric care training in Uganda and having done that training, then looking at strengthening referral from basic healthcare facility level into the regional hospital and looking at what information you need to pass on from the basic level care to tertiary level care and how quickly do you need to do that and then following up and getting feedback so um, the the hospital saying well what did happen what was the outcome and um, if you'd referred a bit sooner maybe it would have been better or actually you did a really good referral and um, you did everything that you could have possibly done before the woman got here and actually the outcome was good so it's that was just about communication it was just improving the um, referral um, system so um, that's a really simple thing and that didn't take loads of, of money to do because it was just supporting better referrals did it have demonstrable um, changes in outcomes? Well, it's it's difficult, isn't it? Because long term, you're looking at um, a reduction in maternal mortality. But um, that was that the the tertiary level hospital there thought that it did make a difference and that they had fewer maternal deaths. Another simple thing, which they which the tertiary hospital then. That I felt it made a lot of difference to um, maternal deaths was um, implementing the use of an early warning score um, for women who were um, post-op, who'd had a cesarean section or who had an a, a obstetric emergency, that they would just have their observations repeated every 15 minutes and a score worked out whether they were getting worse or better and if they were getting worse then the doctor needed to come and you needed to act now um, if they were getting better actually those observations could be reduced and and spread out a bit more and that and that hospital said we they saw a real difference in post-operative deaths and deaths after an obstetric emergency so for instance after an obstetric hemorrhage um, by just keeping a close eye on the women, they picked up whether they were getting better or getting worse and whether they needed to intervene or not. The thing is that the major cause is the top one is postpartum hemorrhage, the second one is sepsis. That's where the, that's the critical point, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there are simple interventions for both of those. And um, yeah, sepsis, for instance, it's just giving the antibiotics quickly. Um, getting the antibiotics in, resuscitating them with fluids, and then making sure the uterus is empty. And, and that's a big um, way that you can manage sepsis better postpartum. I'm looking at the question. There is a, somebody who is interested in whether you've got resources on um, FGM. Um, what I would say, though, Alison, is you're chairing um, a session that we have on Saturday morning, which is uh, we have two speakers debating um, FGM and um, attitudes to it and approaches to it. So wh whoever asked that question, uh, I mean, please do look at the website and that might be a, a session that you might want to come to on Saturday morning rather than explore it in detail now. But I don't know, Alison, whether you wanted to mention that uh, now. Um, yes, the session on Saturday is at 11 o'clock um, and um, yeah, you're very welcome to come to that. We're going to be talking about FGM, um, both overseas and in, and in Wales particularly. Um, I don't particularly have resources on FGM. I've done quite a bit of teaching on, on FGM in the past um, and I've obviously treated women uh, and manage women who have undergone female circumcision. Um, but um, I haven't actually worked at grassroots level to look at alternatives to 
female circumcision. No. So um, I've got another question here about uh, how do you work with the cultural differences around access to contraception and family planning? Um, I mean, you talked about that, you mentioned it in your presentation, but how do you actually work with those cultural issues? I think, um, do you know, there, there are almost two um, groups of people you need to work with. So you need to work with, um, with the community, um, but you also need to work with the healthcare providers because, um, and, and the way to do that, I think, is just to get alongside people and exchange ideas because um, the attitudes um, in many countries is that actually only, fa only married women should have contraception. Um, and, um, and I've heard other people say, well, um, teenagers don't need contraception because it's not legal to have sex until you're 18. It's not legal to get married until you're 18. And yet um, other, just starting a dialogue, other um, nurses on delivery suites say, yeah, but we had um, a 14 year old um, deliver this morning or a 13 year old and she had an obstructed labor. So I think it's just getting a dialogue going amongst healthcare providers about um, what they can do and almost empowering them to become agents of change. But it's also getting back down to community level and talking at a community level the benefits of birth spacing. So if, you, if you're having your children too close together, not only are you at a risk of getting an obstetric complication or becoming anemic or whatever, but also the, the children are not having an, a good start in life and you know, you get an increase in um, infant mortality as well if you're having children more than two to three years, um, uh, you know, less than two to three years apart. So I think it's it's, it's about dialogue, really, um, and sharing ideas. And quite often, you know, you also learn back from the local culture yourself. Kind of establishing common goals, isn't it? What, the, what is there something that you constructively work together, mm. uh, uh, and then you, you can get around some of the prejudices and assumptions. Uh, um, I've got a question I wanted to ask, which is something we've talked about, Alison, is, 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 um, and I'm sure it's, it's an issue for um, any partnership working. But since the pandemic, we because of travel restrictions, we haven't been able to do face-to-face -face teaching and training, capacity building and interaction. So even the dialogue that you're talking about, if you want to get alongside communities, that's been more of a challenge. But particularly in terms of practical skills teaching, how is it that we can do, move the, because a lot of what you're talking about is practical skills. You know, midwifery is practical skills, isn't it? And providing um, larks is a practical skill. How can we teach those skills when we can only do online for the time being? I think that's really important. And I think, you know, theoretical training is fairly easy. Um, but I think the practical skills and the clinical skills particularly are difficult. Um, I think there are ways you can do it with um, with videos, with animation, so that the, the steps are very, very clear. So you make it as easy as possible. I think you can do some um, demonstrations where you, you um, have more than one camera so that you can look at things at different angles and you can demonstrate. Um, and that that's a possibility. I think ultimately, though, um, translating theory into practice. So theory um, from the classroom into um, the workplace, into the wards, into the operating theatre. Um, I think that's going to need us to train the trainers and then to have um, people supervise and mentor people on the job. So you, you need to pass that on to on the job training um, at that stage. So I think it's important to find your partners at the other end of your health link who can then go on to supervise and mentor um, your, the people you're training at the other end. 
And certainly when um, I've been involved in training, the thing that makes the real difference are the mentors or the supervisors that um, go into the workplace and actually watch what people are doing and help and, and um, support people doing new techniques. I think you make a really good point there, and it's that uh, most of us have been trying to use a train the trainer approach anyway, but it makes it even more powerful, doesn't it? So we've all, we know that our partners do have people who have got those skills, those practical skills, and it's supporting them to be able to deliver as, as much as possible and as imaginatively as possible, isn't it? And that's also more sustainable than any of us doing hands-on training, isn't it? So. It's a model that we, we are um, much more moving towards anyway, but we're all learning on how to do that. Um, we have got um, one of um, one of our colleagues is doing a session. Um, I can't remember what day it is. Maybe someone can put it in the chat as a link. Um, but Dr. Ian Haps, who's a, um, a GP training program director and um, has got very used to using online uh, training methods in his day job here and is also um, using that with a partnership with Lesotho so he's doing a session on how to do training online so um, if people are interested in that it's not just for, for GPs by any means but it's a, anybody who's interested in educational methods so um, and that's something that we're trying to explore through the Health Links Network. So maybe if I can mention at this point, anybody online know it, we do have um, the Wales for Africa Health Links Network has got eight trustees um, and we are um, looking very much to how we respond to the current pandemic and the challenge of climate change and the Black Lives Matter movement. There's been so much that has made us rethink how we do health partnerships. So as a network, we're very keen to support anybody who's doing partnership working. So do just get in touch with us. Um, if uh, we're reading our website at the moment, so probably the best way to get in touch is through Hub Cymru Africa or um, to, uh, I'm on Twitter, so people can find me on Twitter. It's Catherine J. Thomas on Twitter. So by all means, tweet me or direct message me um, or email. Um, Catherine Thomas at hotmail.com. So if anybody's interested in taking this further or getting involved with any of the um, uh, Health Links Network work and um, just saying that we've got events going on over the next um, day or two, we have got um, five minutes left. So if anybody else has got um, a question, then put it in the box very quickly. But I just wonder if Alison would like to... Um, sort of take the opportunity to, to, to say a few words to close. And we'll see if a question comes in. I might, I might ambush you with a, another question if somebody wants to get in while they've got a minute or two. But Alison, over to you. Um, thank you. I, I suppose the thing is, um, I am just passionate about women's health in low resource settings. I think that it's been um, under, prioritized and it makes so much difference to individual women but then also to their families and their communities um, and so and I think a lot of the time the solutions are not difficult they're, they're simple and we already have the means to address these things but we we need more education about women's health so that we can see that we can make a difference and I think the other thing is that we need to look at our attitudes. How do we feel um, about women's health? How do we feel about um, gender-based violence and things that are going on? It may seem um, or, or towards prejudice and um, do we start, you know, shouldn't we be standing up against child marriage, for instance, because that's so damaging to a young girl's um, future. Um, so there's so much we can do. I think. Um, we just each need to examine ourselves to say what small part can we play. It may may uh, not feel like we're doing very much, but all together those drops form an ocean. So I think we can all do something to to help women's health. And just thank you for letting me have an opportunity to, to share this afternoon. I love that, Alison. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're all drops in the ocean, but that's uh, words of hope. 
Um, so I've just got, uh, somebody's said here that they're from the FET conference, um, but we're interested in the other sessions. Or the, all our sessions um, over the next five days, four days, are in the agenda on the FET conference. So if you look in those, you will get a link. But if you go to, if you Google Hub Cymru Africa, you go to the website and there will be all the sessions there and you can register for each one individually and um, attend each one that you're interested in. So anybody who's not from Wales, you are very, very welcome. Anybody from the rest of the world is very, very welcome. So um, if you just go to Hub Cymru Africa website, um so um, alison you've, you've yeah. been a, sorry kat you i was gonna oh. say I've, I've, just to flag with everybody i've put the link um in the chat box there to both the registration for the hub Cymru africa sessions of the next couple of days um and also as we've been listening to the the really brilliant presentation there from alison i've put in a few links to other organizations which do really good um women and girls empowerment um, particularly referencing the 12 plus program which the clinton foundation is supporting at the moment and some of the research coming out of the population council which specifically targets this issue of girls needing better clearer reproductive health information from a much earlier age um so do scroll back through the chat box and see if any of that's of interest to people that's brilliant cat thank you very much i mean we could go on for a long time this has thrown up lots and lots of interesting questions and uh, uh, Alison, you've made the case really powerfully. So we, this is all recorded. So if people want to go back and have a listen again, or want to look at any of the resources, it will be on the Hub Cymru Africa website. Um, and if you have any suggestions for future sessions, then by all means, come back to us. We can maybe explore some of the issues that we talked about in a bit more detail. So I'm sure Alison will be very happy to respond if there's a particular topic that anybody would like to explore further. Um, so it just remains for me to say, well, thank you to Hub Cymru Africa for uh, providing support to this event. The Health Links Network is, um, is a partner in Hub Cymru Africa and your, your support in the organization this has been great. And thank you again to Alison. Thank you. Very powerful, thank you. Thank you. Um, and if I can just flag as well that we have a feedback form, both in English and in Welsh, at the, again, in the chat box. If people would like to fill that in and give feedback for this event, we're always interested to hear what you've thought. Um, and thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Alison. Really good session. Thank you. I'm ending the broadcast now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.